his research in teaching. Uh, is resides in social and political philosophy, social political philosophy, and pragmatism, among other fields. He's written Cesar Chavez and the Common Sense of Nonviolence, a University of New Mexico Press publication, and is currently co-editor of the Journal of Philosophy of the Contemporary World. Thank you all for being here. I want to begin with a quote. Freedom and the recognition of individual rights are what our revolution was all about. They were ideals that inspired our fight for independence, ideals that we have been striving to live up to ever since. Yet it took many years before ideals became reality for black citizens. The last quarter century has finally witnessed significant strides in the full integration of black people into every area of national life. In celebrating ba Black History Month, we can take satisfaction from this recent progress and the realization of the ideals envisioned by our founders. the U.S. Bicentennial, President Gerald R. Ford officially expanded Negro History Week into National Black History Month. In his official remarks, which I've just read to you from, Ford noted how historian Carter G. Woodson created the holiday in 1926 to mark the significance of African American contributions to U.S. history. Ford suggests that Black History Month represents our country's efforts towards the full realization of the Founding Fathers' democratic aspirations. Its purpose is to showcase the ways in which African Americans have helped to enshrine freedom and individual rights in everyday life. African Americans, in other words, have assisted the United States to achieve its full potential. Now, the African American scholar W.E.B. Du Bois, who was one of the first African Americans to graduate from Harvard University and studied extensively with the great American philosophers William James and Josiah Royce, went on to help uh, establish the National for the advancement of colored people and was editor for many years of its intellectual journal, Crisis, would have agreed with President Ford that African Americans have made the United States a better society and helped it to reach some of its democratic ideals that were stifled by the institutions of slavery and segregation. Yet Du Bois believes that the struggle of African Americans is more than just about the fight to integrate themselves into an already established and articulated framework of rights, duties, and civic responsibilities. In an article in the journal Crisis, published in 1926, Du Bois alludes to the possibility that African Americans collectively possess a utopian vision that can press the United States to become a richer kind of society than what the Founding Fathers envisioned. He suggests that U.S. American democracy has the potential to grow and change in response to the culturally specific insights of African Americans. And so this is a quote from W.E.B. Du Bois in 1926. Do we, that is African Americans, do we simply want to be Americans? Once in a while, the clairvoyance, some clear idea of what America really is. We who are dark, that white Americans cannot. And seeing our country thus, are we satisfied with its present goals and ideals? Pushed aside as we have been in America, there has come to us a if it were really a beautiful world, a world where men know, where men create, where they realize themselves, where they enjoy life. It is that sort of world that we, African Americans, want to create for ourselves and for all of America. In an article published in the Atlantic Monthly in 1901, W.E.B. Du Bois says that the black freedom struggle in the United States is about trying to push the United States towards establishing this more beautiful society, this more beautiful world. And of course, this gets turned into the language of the beloved community by Martin Luther King in the 60s. Right. And what W.E.B. Du Bois said was that the, that the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments should be understood as culminations, as the fruits of the black freedom struggle in an attempt to try to establish this particular beautiful society, this utopian vision. Now, what I want to do is to try to help us to understand what exactly is it that W.E.B. Du Bois understood African Americans contributing to this radical vision of the United States and hopefully to also see ways in which this radical vision still push, can still push us forward to become even a better society. And the important point to understand from all this is W.E.B. Du Bois believes is that this is an African-American contribution to 
the United States. So in other words, that African Americans have not simply lived up to the ideals of the Founding Fathers. In fact, what he says is that the ideals of the Founding Fathers were not all that great. And in fact, that our democracy owes whatever greatness it has to the struggles and the contributions of African Americans. So, in 1924, in a book called The Gift of Black Folk, W.E.B. Du Bois argues that blacks have actively agitated to transform public political culture in the United States in directions that were not at all envisioned by the Founding Fathers. He writes, One cannot think then of democracy in America or the modern world without reference to the American Negro. The democracy established in America in the 18th century was not and here importantly, and was not designed to be a democracy of the masses of men. And it was a single people to fail to see the ambiguity of democracy and slavery. It was the Negro himself who forced consideration of this incongruity, who made emancipation inevitable and made the modern world at least consider, if not wholly accept, the idea of democracy, including men of all races and colors. So the first cultural co contribution to the United States offered by African Americans is precisely in bearing witness to and opening up a new moral dimension to U.S. American democracy. For Du Bois, the efforts of African Americans did not just expand the sphere of civic eligibility to include more individuals in democratic life. After all, there had been movements to enfranchise serfs, indentured servants, industrial workers, all sorts of people for centuries in Europe and the United States. Instead, the African-American freedom struggle is, according to Du Bois, a fight to extend participation in power to individuals in virtue of their basic humanity, regardless of their social status, occupation, gender, or race. A recognition, Du Bois says, of human beings as such. Right, and so this is what I call uh, Du Bois pointing out that what African-Americans have done is to try to ground Right, American democracy in an ethical foundation. Right, and you can see this ethical foundation established in the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, which says that equal protection to all persons within the United States, not citizens. Right, the language of citizenship is not there in the 14th Amendment, but of persons. And this is congruent with what Du Bois says, is that what African Americans were trying to get the United States democracy to recognize is the basic humanity of African Americans. The long and continuous battle against the institution of slavery, sometimes violent as in the case of the Haitian Revolt, sometimes every day in the case of work stoppage or slowdown, and sometimes with rational appeal to justice, equality, and liberty, demonstrates that what is at stake is the notion of basic human dignity. So for Du Bois, this ethical aspect of the black freedom struggle, the attempt to address the needs of human beings as such, was most evident during Reconstruction, when African-American politicians and voters worked to build public schools, hospitals, and to create welfare institutions for farmers, poor children, the deaf and the blind. These efforts not only benefited the black community, but also poor white families who were often by wealthy elite landowners. Indeed, Du Bois credits the rise of the democratic impulse amongst poor and rural white Americans under Andrew Jackson. White supremacist determination not to be outdone and overshadowed by the successful legislative efforts of the black community. Thus, in Du Bois' estimation, the positive developments in U.S. American democracy have owed their origins not to the wisdom of the founders unfolding through history, but in large part to blacks who have consciously fought for recognition of their humanity against the ideals and institutions built by the founders. Du Bois writes, the motive force of democracy has nearly always been the push from below rather than the aristocratic pull from above. The African-American freedom struggle not only broadens our political understanding of democracy in new ways, but according to Du Bois, it also deepens it by asking us to inquire about the meaning of democratic governance as well. In his work, Darkwater, Du Bois maintains that the failures of reconstruction and the establishment of segregation that placed blacks in legalized civic subordination forces us to think about what it means to rule, that is, to direct individual actions of many people to some end. 
In Du Bois' estimation, these two historical developments, segregation and the dismantling of, of, of Reconstruction, arose as a result of white elites making the case that the practice of democratic ruling, of democratic leadership, ought not to be shared extensively. And you can hear this kind of language and this kind of discussion taking place now with voter restriction. White supremacists at the time held that extending the circle of democratic ro rulers too widely threatens to create coordination problems among social interests that could bring about social instability. Have too many voters, things get complicated, <laughs> right? Instability goes away. So instead of widespread democracy, folks were saying at this time period, uh, at the end of Reconstruction, some groups of individuals, namely the rich white men, ought to rule benevolently for the benefit of others, such as the poor, blacks, and women. Now Du Bois argues that it's actually this elitist position that leads to social instability. This position is based on an age-old but very faulty assumption. Much of Western political philosophy, starting from Aristotle to Machiavelli and Hobbes, assumes that the reason good monarchies or aristocracies fail is because the leaders drift from being virtuous and benevolent into some kind of corruption. But the real reason that these systems fail is not moral defects amongst the elites, Du Bois argues, but it's because the political leaders in those systems are not able to gather the kind of knowledge they need to be able to rule effectively. Du Bois writes, quote, the rulers did not know or understand the needs of the people, and they could not find them out. Restricting the franchise effectively means limiting information about people's views that can be put into the political uh, system. So in such a despotism, laws then become commands that are imposed upon the majority of people by the elites, embodying their limited social understanding and priorities. The situation is one that eventually breeds resentment, resistance, and social instability, as the African-American freedom struggle demonstrates. For Du Bois, democratic leadership and ruling ought to be grounded instead on the principle of the moral dignity of the individual. Upon this conception, each person deserves respect and rulers must recognize and attend to the needs of individuals as human <coughs> beings, according to the principle that follows from this respect. So here again, what Du Bois is saying is that what African Americans have done is inject this consideration of the basic humanity of people into our political system. And if we take that ethical demand seriously, that means that we have to have various kinds of institutional designs to maintain that basic moral respect for people. Right, and this, uh, this change must be something like this. According to Du Bois, institutions must be designed in this way. Only the man himself, however humble, knows his condition. He may not know how to remedy it. He may not realize just what the matter is. But he knows when something hurts, and he alone knows how that hurt feels." Close quote. So responding to the needs of individuals then means devising systems for collecting and recording their opinions and views. Democratic systems uh, have usually taken this Voting. But Du Bois thinks that the real commitment of democracy requires systems of government than simply allowing people to vote based on their self-interest. So the 15th Amendment was important in trying to expand voting rights to more and more people, but Du Bois wants to push against a sort of lazy interpretation of saying that voting is in and of itself, as long as you have the ability to vote, that's all that matters. But it's how we vote, how we think about voting in this radical way that Du Bois wants us to get to think of. And so Du Bois writes, the right to vote is not merely a privilege, not simply a method of meeting the needs of a particular group, and least of all a matter of recognized want or desire. Democracy is a method of realizing the broadest measure of justice to all human beings, close quote. In other words, democracy is not primarily a system of ruling built around collecting the preferences of the majority of people and then devising laws and public policy to satisfy whatever the majority wants. Instead, it is a system of governance designed to elicit what Du Bois calls the new wisdom from all of its citizens, respecting their moral dignity as agents with their own life plans and that places their perspectives into dialogue with one another. What Du Bois is trying to argue for is an idea that our democracy must be one in which citizens are put into some kind of deliberative dialogue with one another. A public discussion that can lead to the formation of policy which encompasses more than just a snapshot of what most people want at any moment, but instead aspires to create the conditions for and to capture the considered judgments of people of a wide variety of society. So Du Bois writes, these interests will surely not all be fully realized 
will wait as the conflicting interests will allow. The problem of government, therefore, would be to reduce the necessary conflict of human interest to the minimum. Right? And so the idea here, I think, what Du Bois wants to say is that if we take seriously the idea of democracy, right, and we take seriously the ideal of morality and ethics, and we combine these two together, we have to see the 13th and 14th Amendment as a second American revolution of putting American democracy on a different kind of footing than it was put on by the founding fathers, who were there putting a system of power together to, in Du Bois' estimation, protect a certain kind of privileged elite power. What African Americans have done have blown up this system and put us on a different foundation of morality, of putting the idea out there that what democracy ought to be is respecting the basic dignity of each and every human being. And if we take that moral insight seriously, that means that we have to design certain political institutions in a certain kind of way to address that idea of moral respect. And that means voting has to be done in a certain kind of way, our political life has to be conducted in a certain kind of way, in a deliberative way in which we engage and talk with one another. And for Du Bois, this meant, what I think the sort of push that he would ask us for, and what he talks about in some of these articles is that, are voting and political flawed in trying to respect that ethical dimension? And what he actually recommends is proportional representation in voting. So rather than having two parties to represent all the interests that are possible in the United States, that we should have a wide variety of political parties and political conversations and try to get as many people involved in discussions together and that our institutions should be designed in order to try to encompass the diversity of this kind of perspective. Only such an institutional design, according to W.B. Du Bois, would respect the ethical demands of democracy. And so for Du Bois, the 13th, 14th Amendments are a culmination of this kind of struggle, and for him offer a groundwork for beginning to build this utopian vision of a much more beautiful society that American democracy could be. Thank you.